But that has been long known. It has been known 1750 that the priest of Ilulisat wrote in his diaries, when the weather is good in Greenland, it is cold in Denmark. And when the weather is cold in Denmark, it's good in Greenland. And this is the Arctic Oscillation. He described the Arctic Oscillation, what we know today, as a major driver for the weather in 1750 in the diaries. It's not all new what we know today. Some people have made these observations a long time ago. You say so you can get about uh, uh, 12 meters of core on one yak. So if you're transporting, transporting 500, 600 meters, you got to have a whole herd of yaks. And yaks are kind of like cats. They, they got a mind of their own, so you're trying to move them down, the, uh, down to where the trucks are. Here in Greenland, I have been working on the ice sheet for 25 years, making climate measurements in particular, and also measuring the processes on the ice sheet at one station called Swiss Camp, which is approximately 80 kilometers from Ilulisat here. We have a lot of macaroni, spaghetti. We have a bread machine here. So we make daily our fresh bread. We have a stove, we can make pizza. All the work at the time I started was on ice cores was being done in the polar regions, in Greenland and Antarctica. And all the pioneers in our field were alive and I had a chance to meet them when I was a student. And it so happened that in 1992, Mount Pinatubo exploded, a big volcano in the Philippines. And it cooled the climate by 1.8 degrees. It cooled the Arctic by more than 2 degrees. And we found that fascinating, so we stayed with our station on the ice. There were so many people working in Antarctica and, and, and Greenland that came up with this idea that wouldn't it be great to have a record somewhere in between to compare, the, look at the connectedness between Antarctica, climate from Antarctica, and climate from Greenland. If you would have made measurements only in the early 90s, I would have said Greenland is cooling because the temperature was going down because of that strong reflection in the atmosphere. The small particles from the volcano reflected solar radiation. It was cooling. And in this, these photos, we found this tropical glacier called Calcaya in the Andes of Peru, 18,670 feet. Then after 2000, the temperature really increased. Increased by about two degrees per 10 years. I'm a very firm believer in the 10,000 hour rule, that if you want to be an expert in anything, you got to be willing to put in 10,000 hours, which turns out to be about eight and a half years of your life. And I did that on the Calcaya Ice Cap between the time of the concept and before we actually succeeded to drill it in 1983 using solar power. It is after 2000 we had an accelerated loss of ice. If I look at my station, Swiss Camp, it was also in 2000 where the curve is downwards trend, that means I lose surface height of the station. And since 2000, I lost 12 meters of ice, just at one point. What was really incredible was the, initially how slow the glaciers were retreating and then how they have accelerated coming forward in time. And in such that many of the sites that we drilled early in my career have disappeared because we now know we lose 350 gigatons or cubic kilometers of ice every year in Greenland, which is, by the way, six times the amount of ice we have in the Swiss Alps every year. 70% uh, of the tropical glaciers on Earth are in Peru, in the Andes of Peru. Here you have a country of 34 million people. Over 50% live in the desert on the west coast of Peru depending on rivers that originate in the glaciers up in the Andes. You know, glaciers are kind of like an insurance policy. They accumulate snow uh, during wet seasons and wet periods, and then they melt and release that during droughts and, and dry seasons. But they're getting smaller, so their ability to do that becomes less and less. I am worried that we don't take it seriously enough that the process we see today that are accelerating 
they will accelerate even more in the years to come. Uh, if you're working in Tibet, there are 46,000 glaciers there, and you take a river like the Indus River, it flows through China, through Pakistan, and through India, all nuclear power countries, all depend on that river for its water supplies. So these are, these are places of geopolitical hotspots in the future. And the later we wait, without any countermeasures. And I'm aware we cannot change industry overnight, but we can give incentives to produce clean energy, reduce the amount of CO2. We should work on that very seriously because I do consider it as a threat to humanity on a longer term. It does not sound as a threat if we have a one or two degree warming. It will not stop there. Uh, you look at population projections for the world, by 2050, 50% of the world's population will live in mega cities in southern China and India. And so that water becomes more and more important. Uh, I think it was 1992 when I uh, first testified at U.S. Senate on climate change. And back then I talked about prevention. So that time has come and gone. I think now it's the mitigation, the adaptation, or the suffering.